Uh, my name is Mike kettis -Rouse. I'm the lead manufacturing technologist for the Satellite Applications Catapult. The Catapults are a series of organisations which were established about five years ago in the UK. Um, they are basically designed to facilitate and accelerate commercial innovation, particularly taking technologies at the academic level to an extent, um, levels we refer to as technology readiness levels, and the TRLs run from zero to nine. They were NASA-derived standards in the 1960s. TRL zero is basically a concept, a thought, could I lift myself by my, by my shoelaces? TRL nine is, I've managed to lift myself by my shoelaces and commercialize it, and you can now buy it in the shops unlikely scenario, however. Um, so the catapults focus on taking technology from a technology readiness level of typically four all the way through to six. And this is what we typically call the valley of death. This is where technology ideas, innovation, science, um, uh, manufacturing, other areas like that tend to fall over. Universities and other smaller um, organizations are good at generating it. Sometimes it doesn't make that transition through the valley of death into industry. So the catapults are there to help facilitate that. And the catapults cover a whole variety of areas. They cover everything from renewable energy to precision medicine to high value manufacturing. And in the case of my catapult, satellite applications. Now, in the past, the satellite applications catapult was focused very heavily on what we call downstream applications. And that's basically considering a spacecraft, a satellite, taking data from that spacecraft and utilizing that uh, data for applications on Earth. Now, that might be communications, faster, better um, internet signals, might be telephones in terms of mobile coverage, it might be imaging in terms of I want to see how my crops are developing over the course of the year, or it might be something, for example, like recently like the collapsing dams in Brazil about how do we do disaster recovery wide applications and of course you can never forget global positioning because without GPS and the variety of networks which provide GPS most of us probably wouldn't be able to get home or let alone to work so big areas like that that's what we call downstream application the other side of that though is upstream and upstream is where I focus upstream is basically about how do we get spacecraft into space so are we using a launch vehicle like a rocket are we using a future co conceptual um, launch vehicle like a space plane? How do we communicate from the ground, so a ground-based antenna, to how do we manufacture spacecraft which actually do those jobs, the actual physical satellites? And then even to a little further extent, just pushing a little bit further into the more blue sky area of what else can we do in space? What about in-orbit manufacturing? Not necessarily just building satellites in space, but for example, manufacturing things like pharmaceutics. We can build better cancer drugs in space because we have a low gravity environment. Crystalline structures form better and faster, meaning that it's opening up the opportunity to create a whole variety and a whole wealth of new medicines for a whole variety of conditions, building better materials, building um, uh, better electronics. So there's some really interesting applications about what can we make in space. And then if you really want to start looking to the future, what do we do beyond Earth? We're going back to the moon. We'll certainly be on the moon within 10 years. There's a good probability we'll be in Mars within 20. Where next? Big options. However, um, let's focus a little bit down to where we are today. So today we're in the, uh, what we call new space. New space is a transition from old space. Old space was the domain of the large space agencies and the large um, multinational aerospace companies. NASA, the European Space Agency, companies like Lock Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Airbus. Those companies have defined how space is and they're based on those launch systems like Ariane 5, the Space Shuttle, Atlas, Delta, a whole variety of other launch vehicles and big satellites. satellites typically are the size of anything from a, a small mini car to the size of a bus. They weigh, any, weigh anything from a few kilos to hundreds of kilos, to in some cases many tons. New space is about cheaper, better, faster. It com it's complete dichotomy to old space. How are we going to do things differently? And it's about ultimately cost. Space is expensive. When the space shuttle launched, each launch cost in the region of 350 to 500 million. That's not sustainable, bearing in mind you can, for that launch, you can maybe put a maximum of 20 tonnes in orbit. So rockets are cheaper, but even um, um, nonetheless effectively a Falcon 9, one of the SpaceX's conventional launch vehicles, still cost in the region of 60 to 7 million dollars per launch. So that's a lot. I mean, that number's come down um, by a factor of five, but it's still a lot. So space is about building things smaller, smarter, quicker. And new space is very much about building small spacecraft. So I said earlier about spacecraft being big. 
new space is there's a big focus on how do we make spacecraft smaller but how do we still make them effectively functional useful effective and the ways we do that are through a variety of new design philosophies looking at disruptive technologies where we look into other markets high performance motorsport engineering for example new forms of composites new forms of metal advanced alloy development we even look to biology how do we build complex cellular structures which can absorb impact or absorb radiation so can we learn from nature in terms of how we build some Thing that is fundamentally not even remotely related to nature and by example effectively this is effectively what we would call um, a picosat it's a very small spacecraft and this is actually a physical spacecraft it could if we chose to launch it um, like most spacecraft it has a series of attributes um, this one is about imaging it has fundamentally a small camera on the front it has solar panels on a variety of sides which generate energy because at the end of the day if you don't have power your battery's gonna run out and you can't do anything. Importantly, if you're gonna take pictures and you're gonna have power, you need to tell someone about it, otherwise you've got a spacecraft which fundamentally does nothing. So the uh, rather elegant tape measure um, on the back, which actually serves a very useful purpose. This is the antenna which allows the ground station on Earth to communicate to the spacecraft. And often we are asked, why would you use a tape measure on your spacecraft? Well, the reality is, is actually, it's cheaper to buy a tape measure and cut it to size, and it has conveniently the markings on it, so we can calculate the frequency for the spacecraft than it is to buy an equivalent length of metal, uh, mark it up, and attach it. So, we could argue this is fundamentally disruptive space. Maybe not, not necessarily envisaging where B&Q would help us build better satellites, but the reality is that actually, right now, that approach to mass manufacturing allows us to do exactly that. So a PicoSat like this is useful, but it's not necessarily that use here. useful. It's too small because it doesn't have enough solar panels on it, it doesn't have enough um, effectively computing power on board to do things, and in reality, it can't really position itself either. It has no, no thrusters, no propulsion. Spacecraft, if they're looking towards the Earth, need to be, able to be orientated towards the Earth so they can stay looking at what they're looking at. So we tend to use a standard for small satellites known as CubeSats. And CubeSats is a term that many people probably will have heard bandied around. It's becoming fairly common. But fundamentally, a CubeSat is literally a spacecraft which is about 10 centimeters to a side, effectively a cube, and weighs in a region of about 1.3 kilos. So it's a small satellite, but it's big enough that it can do something. And typically what we refer to CubeSats are, this is what we call a 1U, so this is the CubeSat, and this is what we call a stack. And the stack is where we basically attach the electrical boards inside, the processors, the battery, the solar cells, additional communications, that lives inside the spacecraft. So this is a one-U spacecraft, but we can also have a two-U, which is, by extension, two one-U's connected together, or a three-U, quite easily jumping on, three stacked together. Um, a 3U spacecraft or a 6U spacecraft, which is effectively a 2 by 3 configuration, is significantly more useful than just a 1U. Why? Because you can have more solar on it. The more solar you have, the more power you have, and equally, by extension of that, the more space you have to do things. So right now, there are a whole variety of small CubeSats of that configuration in orbit around the Earth doing a whole variety of functions. One of them includes, for example, the uh, planet constellation. And a constellation is basically a collection of spacecraft. It's a new approach to how do we build spacecraft and what do we do with spacecraft. So if we go smaller and we want to build more spacecraft, then the reality is that we put them together in something we call a constellation. Because the spacecraft being smaller mean they can do less compared to a much larger spacecraft. So we put many spacecraft together in a constellation, they can still perform the same function as a larger spacecraft. The advantage is we can build them faster, we can build them cheaper, we can probably launch them faster, which um, means that the time it takes from effectively a project starting to the time you're actually getting commercial benefit is far, far quicker. And critically, what's most important is it means if something goes wrong, and space is still fundamentally a dangerous environment. Rockets don't explode that often, but they still do. The chance of a rocket exploding is about one in 500. So relatively high when you think about the equivalent of being hit by a car is about one in 11 million. So spacecraft have a fairly precarious life. Launching a spacecraft is a pretty precarious experience. A launch of a spacecraft is pretty much the equivalent of uh, the experience that a human would have in terms of um, effectively being born. It's, tra it's a traumatic, terrifying entry to the world. And for a spacecraft, it's a tra uh, traumatic, terrifying exit from the world. And when that happens, things go wrong. And one of the reasons things go wrong is about connections. So if I pick up, for example, this spacecraft. Now, this one is still basically a small PicoSat has nothing in it. 
what will eventually end up in it are a series of boards like this. So this is a processing board. Actually, it's quite similar to a processing board that you might find in, in your mobile phone. So it has a socket here for a SIM card for communication. Not that we use SIM cards in space. Uh, this is for testing. Um, it also has a processing board here, and then it has connectors at the top and bottom, which we allow us to stack these boards together to effectively form, as I referred earlier, uh, the stack in this spacecraft. So this is a larger version of effectively that. Now, the problem with this is, is that these are fundamentally connectors. And every time you connect something together, there's always the risk that motion or acceleration may dislodge it. So we go back to talking about launching. You launch a spacecraft and it starts to shake. It's a phenomenally violent experience because we're taking an object which is basically stationary and we're accelerating it to moving um, in excess of five to six kilometers a second to break away from the Earth. That's a pretty terrifying experience. It doesn't matter whether you're a human or you're a very small satellite. It's, it's generally pretty terrifying. So you can imagine that uh, effectively this thing is shaking backwards and forwards um, violently and the chance of it dislodging and separating or a solder joint breaking or a cable coming loose is actually relatively high. Now we engineer spacecraft, big spacecraft, to fundamentally avoid that by testing them again and again in a variety of conditions. We simulate the conditions of space, hot and cold, we simulate vibration, we simulate shock when a spacecraft separates from its various stages which are um, using effectively different rocket engines to get it higher and higher. It's, it's basically separated with explosives, so there's a loud bang and suddenly the spacecraft comes apart. All of these shocks go through this spacecraft. Big spacecraft get tested a lot, smaller spacecraft get tested less because of the cost of it and the cost effect. So we're um, doing less testing on small spacecraft, yet they're still going to experience the, uh, the same potential shocks. So how do we mitigate against that? And there are two ways. One, well, technically there are three. One, you do more testing, but testing is expensive. It delays your, the amount of time it takes to get something into space. So the two approaches are, one, build more spacecraft. So if you um, launch one and it fails, you've got enough in your constellation and they're cheap enough to launch another one that it doesn't affect your overall functionality of what those spacecraft are doing. Or two, you look at new technologies which allow you to join materials together without effectively joining them. And this is where technologies which the um, rather overly used term 3D printing or as we refer to in the industrial uh, environment, additive manufacturing um, come in. So the ability to take structures, for example, and join, uh, there we go. So the ability to take structures together like these, so these are dampers for spacecraft. So for example, the base of this would effectively sit on the top of the rocket and then we would attach the small spacecraft via its docking clamp to the top. So any vibration and motion is basically reduced. So effectively this is dampening in the same way that you have suspension in a car to remove the bumps as you're driving and make the experience of driving through a very potholy ro road slightly more um, palatable. The same way we do with spacecraft is we put in dampers to reduce the amount of vibration. And this part, for example, here is made using additive manufacturing. So like most processes, it's built layer by layer by layer. And by building it as one part, as opposed to a conventional damper, which might be built in many parts, we remove that risk of failure. So this is one part. It can only move in these directions. We can rotate it 90 degrees so we could build one on top of another. But because it doesn't have any joins in it, because it's not welded together, because it's not screwed or clamped or even nailed, though I don't think you find nails in spacecraft generally, um, there's very, uh, a, a very low risk that this will actually physically come apart. So building things as one part is super attractive. And that's why technologies like additive manufacturing are becoming very, very common to space. And at the same time, additive manufacturing is good for making low volume components. If you're gonna build a million Coke cans, for example, you're not gonna use additive manufacturing. It doesn't scale. But if you're gonna build 5,000 small spacecraft where you're trying to reduce the overall component count, then additive manufacturing, despite being a relatively expensive technology to utilize, is an ideal technology to utilize. It scales very well. And the other advantage of it is that you can take a component like this, design it, build it at this level, and say, you know what, actually I'd rather it was smaller. So then you scale it. So then you can basically just build it again and now you have something which is exactly the same, you have changed nothing other than you have told the system which is building it to effectively build it at um, one quarter of the scale. So it performs in exactly the same way, the materials have the same properties and you have the same performance throughout. So that becomes phenomenally attractive when you're trying to build complex objects, complex spacecraft. And that extends going beyond just, for example, spacecraft. That extends the new generation of launch vehicles we'll see.
So the ubiquitous, uh, effectively, SpaceX Falcon 9. Very common, uh, or comparatively common for a rocket, very reliable, and has been built using a variety of new launch technologies, new manufacturing technologies. At the same time, though, we're seeing a multitude of new launch companies, some in the UK. There's only, currently, right now, there's 13 small companies of various scales building launch vehicles, aspiring to make access to space cheaper. And, and then worldwide, there's at least another 120. So suddenly, whereas five years ago, there were maybe a dozen launch companies, all predominantly large aerospace companies or government organizations, now suddenly we've gone up by order of magnitude. 120, 130 is growing on basically a monthly um, basis. We're seeing more of these launch companies coming out and developing new capabilities, saying, actually, we're going to build rocket engines like this. Actually, we're going to go with this configuration. Most of them will fail. Rockets are complicated. Well, actually, no, rockets are not complicated things. Rockets are really simple. But building rockets which are reliable and which don't explode on a regular basis is really hard. And then doing that and building that cost effectively is even harder. So, again, we see technologies like additive manufacturing, the ability to use advanced materials, dedicated specific alloys, new types of plastics. These are key technologies which allow us to build better systems. So, Again, another additively manufactured component. It looks incredibly simple fundamentally. It's square at one end and it's round at the other. You could argue, well, that's a pretty easy thing to make. But if I wanted to make this using what we would term subtractive manufacture, then that's effectively where we're taking away material to build up the part we want. I could machine this. So I could take a block of, for example, plastic, or to take a block of steel, and I could machine. But if you think about it, it would have to be this larger than this object. And also in the middle, all this material has to come out. So all I'm doing basically is taking a large object and reducing it down to end up with a smaller object. Or, um, by extension of that, I could take a flat sheet material like plastic or stainless steel and I could basically machine it, bend it and weld it into the shape. But I go back to my earlier point. If we were effectively machining this and assembling it, this would be effectively a join line, this would be a join line, this up here would be another join line. So what happens is I end up with multiple joins, welds and seams. All, from a launch perspective, are effectively failure points. So by building it like this, I have one component. It's built quickly, it's built efic efficiently. It's built without those effectively um, inherent failure points. So these sort of structures are ideal for launch vehicles. And this is part of the ducting component. So this is part of environmental ducting. It's not particularly exciting. It's not, it's not a nozzle for a rocket engine. It's made of a plastic we, um, called Ultem, which is very temperature stable in space. It doesn't outgas. So we don't see trapped gases. When you make something, you see gas trapped inside structures. We don't see those gases leave the structure because when they leave, they can leave rather explosively in the vacuum of space, which can render a part um, effectively um, fundamentally broken but at the same time it's also tolerant to UV light and that's important as well so you can build structures like this and as I say not exciting you couldn't use this as a rocket nozzle it would melt very rapidly but you can use it for key components and the other aspect of it is not just in terms of the manufacturing not just in the terms of the reduction of the number of failure points you can also optimize it for the shape so you can take a structure which is designed to function in one way and then you can optimize it and build it so it's much lighter so what by extension of that um, we are increasingly seeing components like this so this is a housing for a motor um, the motor basically the body of the motor lives in this section and the front of the motor protrudes out of here and this is for basically a space-based joint on a spacecraft um, we can build this basically as one component we could do a lot of machining or we can basically um, use additive manufacturing to build it so now inside I have a bracket to mount the motor on which is part of the lower housing which then fits into the upper housing and it fits seamlessly together so where in the past this, this would be multiple components and would weigh probably significantly more this is a relatively light component yet performs exactly the same functionality we can build it in a tenth of the time for a, a, probably a twentieth of the cost and we can reduce the overall weight by a fifth those factors when you're trying to manufacture anything if you can say from a manufacturing perspective i'm going to build it faster i'm going to build it better it's going to weigh less and it's going to cost you less those are usually the sort of um, targets that ideally that real really efficient and highly desirable production demands and if you can do that the cost of launch vehicles the cost of spacecraft drops because each component you're building is costing you less yet it can still perform the same functionality in some cases it can perform even more and that's why these technologies are fundamentally changing how we perceive space and what we can do in space and ultimately if we want to go beyond our own earth if we want to go beyond our own moon
and we want to go beyond our own solar system. It's going to be fundamental that we take technologies like this and we adopt them in new ways. So right now what we're seeing in new space in terms of the evolution of small satellites in orbit around the Earth being built cheaper, quicker and faster and they're not just being built typically by large organizations and space agencies. These small satellites are fundamentally so simple that the reality is that uh, a group of 14 year olds could put one together in an afternoon. Now, I'm not su suggesting that 14 year olds should build spacecraft yet, but there's nothing to prohibit effectively schools and right now many schools and universities and private um, groups are building spacecraft and to an extent are launching them. Now, they're not launching them on their own um, launch vehicles. Um, owning a rocket and launching a rocket is a very different matter to building a small spacecraft. But the ability to do that and the ability to build small spacecraft and then have them launched is a great way to both attract uh, a whole variety of new skills and new individuals into an exciting sector, grow our economy and ensure that people with skills or effectively people with the aspiration to have skills have the opportunity to engage. So new space is one of these rev revolutionary areas which is it's changing a generation, it's changing how we think about technology and it's changing people's ambitions and that ambition to go further, faster, quicker you know, the, the much um, and again overly used term of the final frontier well the good aspect in a way is there is never a, we never get close to the final frontier because every time we do get close we discover that we can do something else and we just go a little bit further 3d printing as a method of actually building something on site absolutely so you're, you're talking about in situ resource utilization yeah. uh, lo lovely um, a well remembered acronym yeah. um, uh, <laughs> So in situ resource utilization is taking the materials you might find on the moon, regolith which is lunar soil, or on Mars the Martian equivalent of terrestrial soil and equivalent materials and building structures. And absolutely you certainly can do some of that. The slight challenge we have is every time we think that we've found the right material or the right analog to those materials, it doesn't always quite add up in the same way. And originally one of the concepts for occupation um, and inhabitation of the moon was to basically use lunar regolith melt the lunar regolith into a glassy-like substance and basically grow your own effectively sort of hemispherical dome. The reality is, is that actually we've gone down various avenues, mostly driven by the space agencies like the European Space Agency in terms of how we might do this. And then people have had an epiphany and said, well actually, why do we want to live on the surface of the moon? Lots of radiation, um, small meteorite bombardments, etc., lots of dust. Why don't we go underground? So suddenly there's been a switch of, actually maybe we don't build things on the surface, we look for a lunar cave. And lunar caves are formed effectively by the cooling of lava, as you find in, um, in, on Earth in places like Iceland. You find natural caves forming where um, the lava is effectively cooled and left a uh, resulting cavity behind. So the reality is, is I suspect future lunar bases probably will be underground. That said, we will probably almost certainly take technologies like 3D printing and utilize that to build structures to fill those spaces up whether we're building airlocks or whether we're building actual rooms or whether we're building furniture, it seems a logical way of doing it. Mars, on the other hand, probably has caves, but we're not entirely sure. Um, so going below ground is harder. So the reality is we will almost certainly look at a variety of initially habitats which we take with us, but at a later date it's highly likely again that we look at structures and there's a whole variety of materials we can use on Mars, whether it's effectively the equivalent of the Martian soil going across to actually ice. So there are some 3D printers, for example, which literally um, are, if you imagine, a rotating cannon which um, effectively tracks round and round in a circle in kind of an upside down way of um, a normal 3D printer which is effectively building down and building over the surface. This sprays water because the, uh, the Martian atmosphere is at, at least minus 30, the water basically freezes instantaneously. So you can basically build a structure of ice which acts um, both as your structural walls, so it gives you strength, it gives you the ability to clad it, and one of the interesting things about water is it's radiation absorbent. So Mars basically um, has a relatively high exposure of radiation. So one of the best ways to mitigate the exposure that uh, astronauts on Mars will have and f uh, future human settlers is to use water as a barrier to absorb that radiation. So if you build your effectively your ice house, your ice house is both providing you with your thermal protection and it's providing you with your radiation protection, it's providing you with some impact, impact protection and it's a f and at the same way as if you've ever built an igloo for example, being in an igloo most people assume by default it's cold but the reality is the ice acts as an insulator and being in an igloo you can actually light a fire and no, it doesn't melt your igloo. Well, it won't, as long as it's a relatively small fire, um, you actually stay warm. So ice is a really interesting material to utilize. The drawback is it's very hard to prototype that because if you imagine trying to basically find an environment on Earth 
even in the Antarctic, where you can basically build an ice-like structure and um, test in it in fairly extreme conditions is pretty challenging. But the reality is, if we ever want to do that on Mars, the probability is we're going to have to build some form of ice house on the Earth in the first place.